Mellon live in one minute. Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hello, hello, hello. It's a Wednesday, but I suppose you knew that much. But did you know it's the 16th of July? Ha! It is, I think. It says so right over there. And did you know that I finally got Jacob Bacharach here? I mean, I've been talking about this guy. I was talking about this from the first time I heard about it before I think it was even in book form. Advanced publicity. Okay, advanced publicity. Yes, I did give you some. And then I sort of sort of fell down on the job. Fell down, got totally screwed up, and then didn't get the book read in a timely fashion, but I have now since I'm on the mend, and I'm squawking about it again. Good. It's good. <laughs> Thanks. Is that the bend of the world? Jacob Backrack, ladies and gentlemen, sitting right next to me. He is a Pittsburgher from birth. From birth? Well, with some detours to Greensburg and Uniontown. I've done the tour, the tour of Western Pennsylvania. Oh, really? Yeah, you, I went to you, high school in Uniontown. You did? Vietnam. Vietnam. <laughs> yeah. Don't I have a, you never pegged me for a country boy? No, I sure <laughs> as hell did not. Yeah. Then you went off to college in another, uh, you know, uh, sort of a cornfield in Ohio, right? Yeah, a cow pasture. A cow pasture. Yeah. Oberlin. Oberlin. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's it's like a it's like a wealthy suburb in the middle of a cow pasture. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have a nephew there now. Oh, really? Yes. 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 And he's an odd person. Everyone there is an I odd person. I think everyone there is an yeah, odd person. That's, that was what attracted me to the place. They have some weird lawsuit going on right now. Are you aware of it with one professor suing another? Yeah. Pe- are you aware of well, this Well, one, one of those professors was a French professor of mine. I think it was his first or second year at Oberlin, and it was my probably first year at Oberlin. Um, Ali Yedis, I think, is his name, and he, uh, he, I took a, a French class from him. They all have weird names, the professors that are involved in this weird yes. thing, and there's almost sort of like a – sort of a, a – some kind of potential of terrorism underneath it and stuff. It is so bizarre. Yeah, I know. We used to just uh, – Oberlin used to just get its – get bad national press for its, like, goofy um, – Free oh. speech codes and and you, and sex and sex policy. Were but you now, there? Were you there when they had that? When the Oberlin sex policy came out? Because man, I had a riot yeah, was, with it was, that. It was right after Antioch. Antioch and then Oberlin. Both in Ohio for whatever reason, yes. right? And there was yeah. Lynn. May I move to the next step with you? You know that sort of. That's thing. That's right. That's what it was, and it said like you know, so you're you know you're hot and bothered with your you know something other, and you're you're like, blah, blah, blah. and before a guy can make a move, he would have to literally say, Yeah, may, may I, mother, may I, Ma, mother, may I touch your left breast in the lower right quadrant? It was well intentioned. <laughs> oh, it's it so. <laughs> and 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 it well never mind. Oh, the bend of the world by Jacob <laughs> Becker. So, y- yo, I yeah, I take it you majored in how to write a novel. Uh, I I studied English and English literature and creative writing at at Oberlin, but I, I didn't actually. Re- I, I I took a little fiction, but mostly I wrote poetry in college. Uh. Yeah. 
And then I quit writing poetry and thought I, I should get into prose because it, you can make a lot more money yes. writing prose. Yes. But then I wrote a book and found out that the, you can't the make dollar any. truth, you can't make any money <laughs> doing that either. Prose, poetry, it doesn't matter. You can't make. But prose, you stand a better shot. A slightly better yes, shot. Yes, I think so yeah. too. So instead, you end up entering the real world. And I see here that you are, I'm going to get your, is this, if, if what's on the jacket is still absolutely correct. You are an arts administrator at the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust and manager of the Benedum. The, yes, the, I'm the operations manager of the Benedum Center. Don't ask. I don't. Ah! Know that, ah! we, we just make up these titles. No, we but get it together must in the middle mean operations night. means it must mean that when a show is coming, you have a lot to do with what getting things. Yeah, I, to I, work. I, uh, I, I make. Uh, I sort of make sure that everyone who actually has to do something is is doing something and is able to do and is something. able and is able, able to, to do, do something. something. Yeah. And, cool. And, and, do you know? And this comes up in your book. Because in the book, the title character has a job, which is never clear what the hell he's doing, nor what his company does, nor is it clear to him. <laughs> and yet he keeps doing it, whatever it is. Then he gets another job, and also that's not clear. Do you know these days when you ask somebody, what do you do, and they tell you that you rarely understand what it is they do? Do yeah, I mean no, like I was, what you just said? I mean, people say, "Oh, I'm a," and I yeah. think, "Oh, I can." I, I mean, I can actually. I, I I think I could actually, you know, define in a few sentences the actual sort of um, uh, outcomes of my labor. But yeah, a lot of people they have these jobs, these sort of cadres of middle management jobs. Um, really, the inspiration for that was was there were, there were two things. W one is that I, I have a good friend who actually I'm I'm looking out the, the window of you your studio right now, his... and I can see that well it's now the K and L Gates building, but it used to be the Ariba building, and before that it was the Free Markets building. You probably oh remember. yes yes yes. So when so I had a friend who worked at Free Markets, <laughs> and I used to say, "What the hell did you do there?" Well, I don't know. I made money. I don't know what I did. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then uh, a couple years ago. In having nothing to do with the book, sort of as a in pursuit of arts management career, I, I actually went, I went to Pitt. I went back to school. I got an MBA, the most uh -huh. hysterical degree ever. Uh -huh. I really don't know what I did there. I drank at Hemingway's a lot at lunchtime. <laughs> and wait a minute, are you telling me an MBA is also a bunch of oh, it's a BS? Crack, it's a crackpot degree. It's, I, is it really? Yeah, I know there's some good stuff. There's there's good stuff about it, but mo mostly. Um, Mostly, it's uh, you. You spend a lot of time drinking, drinking beers. <laughs> I, there's this amazing sandwich at Hemingway's called called the Wake and Bake, which is like eggs and and other stuff all piled onto it. So I spend a lot of time drinking beer and eating Wake and Bakes at well, Hemingway's. Well, your figure doesn't show it. <laughs> but so, uh, you know, I I went to school. It was a what's called an executive MBA program. So it's all kind of mid career professional types going back. Um, back to school to get degrees, and and a lot of these guys, the nicest guys in the world. I mean, I I really got along with them very very well. But I thought, what the hell do you do all day? I I you, you, know, as, as, you know assistant director of this and that. It's like what 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 is that? What what are they? So a lot of people are making good money doing nothing in particular. Yeah. And they're doing it in those buildings. They're do they, they are. I, I know. I often look out there and think. <laughs> and then you know what? They go home. And back to Cranberry and vote for Daryl Metcalf. <laughs> Is that not right? Yeah, yeah. And you wonder what's wrong with the world. I know. Yeah, I mean, that, that's who lives in Treesdale. Okay. That's I right. always wondered. And then I found out. And I went and I got an executive MBA. I said, oh, that's who lives in Treesdale. <laughs> the bend of the world, Jacob. We're going to get to it. I swear to God, we are. We are. Let's see. What I so love about this book, because I, I love reading books that are set in Pittsburgh just because I can, you know, like really see where a thing is going on and stuff. I think your descriptions of the city are just wonderful. They're wonderful. They are funny. They're spot on. Do you ever, will you ever, could, could I ask you to read a page? Yeah, I, yeah I'd read a page. Even if it's a page you don't 
even think is well, one no, of your best? Uh, yeah, I, I'll read any page out of the book. I just had to read the book. We just recorded the audio book oh, for for, aud- for Audible.com, and I did it. I did it. Uh, my my agent was really funny. I, I, I wrote to her after. My publisher wrote to me. They said, you know, Audible, they bought they bought the audio rights to your book. They're going to record it. Would you be interested in reading? And I said, I don't know. Would, would I be? And they said, well, you know, sometimes they don't like authors, but sometimes they do like authors. Yeah. So you call them. And so anyway, so I, I talked to them, and they were interested in having me read it, uh, mostly because they... I think they couldn't figure out anybody else who would know how to say all those weird <laughs> Pittsburgh accents and words. So, um, so I, I, so I wrote to my to my agent um, in New York and I said, you know, should I do this? And she said, don't do that. It's a lot of work and the money's shit. And I said, well, I don't know. so I ended up doing it. So, which was actually a lot of fun, but it was a lot of work. And um, how many, like, how far do you get in one session? Well, um, we did they, we did like four six hour sessions. The, the total <gasps> the book. The total actual recorded time of the book is about eight and a half hours of finished time. So um, about four six-hour sessions and then another hour-long session to do final corrections for it. So, um, you know, 25-ish hours of reading uh, to get about eight and a half finished hours. You know, it's funny because on the way here, I'm riding the bus, and I'm thinking I have to have Jacob read something. And then I thought, there was another voice in my head and thought, oh. You know, you've done that before, and it turns out that authors might be able to write, but they sure as hell can't even read their own stuff. You know, that there's no affect, there's this like, and, um, and well, now I know I can trust you. This is because, so I, I'll, I'll give, I'll send out props to my daytime employer, daytime and nighttime employer, sometimes the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust. I will say that when you have to frequently um, talk about a, a really dry subject like, catalyzing economic development through investments in the arts. You learn very quickly to make yourself into an interesting speaker because the topic is so dry. So it served me really well now that I'm now that I'm an author. When I have to go out and actually talk about writing books and, and read from the book, I'm, I, I think I have affect. Wait a minute. Okay, just back up there a minute. <laughs> catalyzing. Catalyzing. What's a perfectly okay word for catalyzing that more people might understand immediately i oh i i always i always want to miss this business <laughs> i always want to misuse the, i always want to use okay, the word cattle. suborning but that sounds that's no! criminal <laughs> no suborning so, so, yeah truth. so um Catala- in, catalyst in, is in, something uh, yeah that, encouraging that's right okay yeah. so okay catalyzing yeah. what was the rest of it you said economic development encouraging economic development en- encouraging people to spend money by uh, by scamming them, scamming them into spending a bunch of money on a Broadway show and a dinner beforehand. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's there what we it do. Is. But okay. it's, I, it's been good for the city. It's been oh, good for me. Man. Well, how would you, if somebody said, you bump into a friend of your mother's, oh, Jacob, I heard you wrote a novel, and I heard it's getting such good reviews. What's it about? What do you say? Believe it or not. So I, wait, I, I keep answering your questions with digressions. That That's okay. I, I, so, I keep digressing after you answer. So, be, so believe it or not, on, on Monday night of this week, I was actually at my mother's former book club in oh. Uniontown. Oh, my God. Uh, answering exactly such, some, some such questions. What do you say? Um, well, what I, what I say is that um, I say the book is a coming-of-age story. In which nobody really comes of age, <laughs> featuring a Sasquatch. Uh, and people look at me. <laughs> a what? <laughs> and I say, you know, a Yeti. A uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> a Bigfoot. Um, and uh, but uh, really, it's a it's a what the novel is about is it's about it's about a young man, Peter Morrison, who has as we talked about this sort of um, nebulous corporate cog job in this nebulous corporate cog company in an anonymous building in downtown Pittsburgh. And he is in his late 20s, uh, almost 30, kind of just bumping along sort of vaguely with the idea that he ought to be Sort of separating himself from these kind of crackpot friends from his childhood, <laughs> his his old sort of drug and party friends, sort of moving into a more adult world and having no real, actually we'll come back to the world, no real catalyst <laughs> <laughs> to, to cause him to actually do that right. until he sort of serendipitously runs into this older, this older couple who have just moved to town, uh, Mark and Helen. 
who are uh, not only older but more successful, more, more glamorous, a sort of model of what he imagines the adult world to be like. Um, and that sort of leads him down a, a rabbit hole a of rabbit co hole, corporate yeah. skullduggery and, and, con and corporate conspiracies that are in, in many ways the real conspiracies in a book, even as in the sort of background of the book, a bunch of other uh, <laughs> mysterious, nebulous, magical, extraterrestrial things are going on in parallel to, to that story. So if people are like real, are realists and they want a book that is a book that could actually, they might get a little freaked by your book because all of a sudden there's a UFO hovering over Mount Washington and all of a sudden there's, yeah, a Sasquatch. And a, uh, do you think some people can't go there? Or uh, older people? Go ahead, cough. You yeah. can just cough. Where's the cough button? There, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> we, we did have a cough button over there. Well, you don't know? Okay, but no, so I'm, I'm back done. in the real. Uh, so, um, yeah. well, yeah, I think that uh, to to an extent, I think that that's that's true. You got to roll it's with it. Not the most. You got to roll with it. Um, there are a lot of strange things that happen in the book, but I actually think there are a lot of strange things that happen in, in all of our lives, and we tend to just sort of repress them and, and push them aside right. and write them off. And and that's actually one of the I think points of conflict in the book between between Peter, the narrator, and his his friend, his best friend. Johnny. Peter writes these things Peter, off. Peter writes these Johnny things off. Johnny jumps in with both Johnny feet. Johnny believes everything. Everything. He, oh. and, and Peter treats it all as a joke. He likes it. He's interested in it. He'll talk to Johnny about it. But mm -hmm. he, he treats it all as a sort of, a sort of great cosmic joke, um, whereas Johnny um, treats it all as being ab actually and literally true. And and slightly sinister, frightening, and slightly and, sinister, and conspir frightening. conspiracy, and, and it may very well be true. I've I, I actually that's something I often tell people. They they ask me if you know are the UFOs real? I, say, I don't know. I never figured that out. I finished writing the book, but I never figured out. Oh wait, if, if the, the UFOs, yeah, yeah, are the UFOs really, never really, there. yeah, they're, they're, you, they're you there, left but that they're not hanging. there. Yeah, but you do go in. A Pittsburgh plays a huge role in this book because Pittsburgh is like the the epicenter of everything in this book, right? Of yeah. The whole world of the beginning, the end, and the who knows what. The yeah, it's – well, so I want – I always I always knew that the book would be predominantly set in Pittsburgh. I'm, I, I like regional fiction and honestly – I mean, how, how many how many more novels can you read about – uh, some about some late twenties guy who you know lives in Brooklyn and wants to write a book. Yeah, there's a lot of that novel. There's that yeah, novel already has yeah, been written, yeah. probably written better than I could write that novel. So I knew that I, I wanted the book to be set predominantly in Pittsburgh, um, have this real sense of place, have this real sense of setting. And I, I mean, I think that Pittsburgh is is geographically and topographically oh, and and culturally fascinating. fascinating. It is. Yeah. It's fascinating. And and right. people outside uh, of this, people inside of the city, I think. Will hopefully will em embrace the book because of that thrill of recognition. But what I about the people outside? Well, I hope that they kind of discover a really a really interesting and strange place. I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, if you think about the growth, the sort of explosion of of Anglophone fiction coming out of sort of uh, other parts of the world, a African Anglophone fiction or Indian Anglophone fiction, you know, that's become very popular yes, yes. in the book world in recent years. One of the reasons I really think that is, is because it actually engages uh, with, a, with a setting and, and people that, you know, your kind of normal book world folks on the coasts in the U.S. aren't really familiar with. And it's the, the, the sort of shock of recognition in that sort of alien uh, or, or foreign or other environment is really uh, compelling for a lot of readers, I think. And although, you know, Pittsburgh is by no means as as um, foreign to the average American reader as, as some of those other places, nevertheless, I think for a lot of people it is. It's this sort of strange but, little corner of Appalachia. <laughs> God <laughs> knows. It'll get, I mean, Pittsburghers will get little, uh, you know, things that I, I if you're not a Pittsburgher, you're not going to get the the name, for instance, of Johnny's blog? Yes, aliens.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Y-I-N-Z, uh, yeah. aliens. And that wouldn't mean anything to anybody who weren't from here. I think that's I think that's true, but I think that it's those, not off it's not off putting to them. No, but I think that they're a little bit, you know, little bits of, you know, the wherever yins and, and that and those little bits of uh, Pittsburghese occur, I think that's more just uh, 
giving a bit of setting and atmosphere. So even if you don't know, even if you don't get specifically the reference, it's just a part of the texture of the world in which the characters are doing whatever it is that they're doing. Okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am going to have Jacob Bacharach read from his book. This is early in the book, and it's a description. They're on their way, he and his girlfriend, uh, whose name I can't stand. I, how, how did you put those two names together? Uh, La- uh, Lauren Sarah. She's, what a yuck. There's... She deserved better. <laughs> what? Well, in a way, she does deserve better. But Lauren, so uh, I really like that character. She's Me sort of too. set up. She's set up in the beginning of the book. I mean, you because the book is a first person, told in the first person, you only ever you know sort of perceive her through the eyes of right. Peter and his friends. And so she's sort of set up in the beginning of the book to be this sort of you know annoying character. She's his girlfriend, but uh, bit of a ditz. she's a bit of a ditz, and mm. um, she's sort of annoying, um, and it's a bit of an airhead. Uh, and she smokes too much weed and all that stuff. And uh, in the end, she's actually, I think, kind of one of the characters who's more redeemed in the book. I mean, she's one of the few who's not actually really kind of an asshole. I mean, Peter, that the is, narrator, is kind of an asshole. Yes, so, he is. Yes, you know. he is. So in any case, um, I, I came up with that name um, predominantly because I thought it was really annoying. Are you kidding? <laughs> oh, yeah. Did no, you? I mean, it was like, I was like, what's the, most, what's the most annoying because name? Because it doesn't go to get Lauren Sarah. Yeah. And then that somebody with that name would say, I use both. I mean, you could pick one or the other and it'd be fine. Yeah. This is Lauren or this is Sarah, but Lauren, Sarah. It's a through joke in the book, too. Everybody comments on the fact that she has two names. Yeah. Even she comments Even on the fact she that comments. she has two names. And they call her Laura. Nobody can get it right anyway, but I did hate that name. I just wanted you to know, but it turns out I was maybe supposed to. Um, okay, so they're going to an art exhibit at the Carnegie. Yes. Okay. And who do we have here? We've got Lauren, Sarah, <laughs> and we've got the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the narrator, and we have Johnny. Johnny. Okay. Yeah. I just want if you could just start there and end up all the way to where do you get this shit? Okay. Where can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. Do sure. it. Here okay. we go. Yeah. So they're they're on their way. Uh, they're they're uh, on their way. Actually, they're they're just coming. I guess at the beginning. Uh, over the Bloomfield Bridge and heading towards Oakland, um, presumably, I guess, down Bigelow Boulevard, um, on their way to the museum for an opening. Um, They cleared the accident and made it to Oakland, parking on a side street a few blocks from the museum near the Cathedral of Learning, or, as Johnny put it, the phallus of yearning, a gothic skyscraper in the middle of the University of Pittsburgh campus, as if some drunk god had grabbed the top of a squat medieval monastery and yanked it heavenward like a piece of saltwater taffy, ornate and kitschy and very slightly fascist in its fidelity by pastiche to an imaginary past. Ironically, the Cathedral of Learning was just across the street from the Carnegie Software Institute, a dour and actually fascist building, all outscaled marble columns still half stained from 60 years of soot and exhaust in whose basement, according to Winston Pringle, who's he's the sort of sci-fi author in the story. Great name. Uh, in the, according to Winston Pringle, his father and a group of German emigre scientists first succeeded in 1949 in opening a microscopic doorway between our quantum reality and the next one over. On the green between the two was Heinz Chapel, another goofy bit of architectural homage, a near replica of the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, although Johnny once told me that it was exactly 57 paces from the cathedral to the chapel and 57 paces from the chapel to the institute. (laughs) Well, that makes sense, I guess, I said, like Heinz 57. (laughs) Yeah, Johnny said in a scoff, sure. You do know that 57 is the number of times the moon is mentioned in the Bible, right? 47 in the old and 10 in the new, and that Baal was actually a moon god who served as an early model for Lucifer, and that the Heinz family were notable Satanists who built the chapel as a place to conduct black masses. Jesus Christ, dude. Alumni Hall is 57 paces in the other direction, perpendicular, and it's the old goddamn Masonic temple. Are you that naive? Where do you get this shit, I said. Have you ever paced it out? 
Come on, but I, I, I have. Wanted to. I, I have Larry, actually. I will say, I have. Is it anywhere close? It's pretty ah! close. <laughs> so did you just make that up for before you said? I mean, what I did. did. I, I, I that I I will say I did. I did make that up. There there are, there are a few, um, but it turns out to be pretty close pretty to the truth. Pretty close. There are a few places in the book. I mean, I I tried to stick pretty closely to the actual real geography of Pittsburgh, but yeah. there are a few places where I made make minor alterations just to serve the, the needs of the story. And it was funny, I, I did a reading at the library not too long ago. Oh. And and there's a the one of there was a, a woman there who that she raised her hand to ask a question after I did the reading. And she said, You can't really go up 18th Street on the <laughs> south side and get to Grandview. <laughs> And, which is true. Which is well, true. you can, but you really have to wind around up there to get there. But I said, well, yeah, that's true. I had to make a minor. I, I had to smush together two parts of the South Side slopes to get them there. But. I have annoyed many an author, especially the people who write mysteries set in Pittsburgh. And I'll say, what do you mean the guy looked out the window on, you know, Forbes Avenue and saw blah, 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 blah. It's totally impossible. <laughs> Yeah, I I got I had a, one of the copy editors who worked on the book in its during the editing phase um, was someone who who took a look at it, gave it a sort of second pass over, and noticed that I had as they're actually um, not long after the section I just read, they're driving uh, down Fifth uh, out of Oakland, heading towards the South Side actually, and I had put the hospitals on the wrong yeah. side of the road. Originally, they're on the right side of the yeah, road yeah, now. Yeah, but, something um, like that. So, That's and right. and he he caught it, and he said, "What's wrong with this guy?" It's like, "Is he really from Pittsburgh? How could you get that wrong?" Um, I, I said, "I don't know. They were all really drunk at the time, so maybe." But the I, I mean, just... may, it's it's good because I guess it could some little thing like that for somebody who knows can pull you out of the. Yeah. Out of the fiction. Oh, it's amazing it, how many mistakes they catch in copy editing. I was totally, as a first-time novelist, I was totally unprepared. Well, now that's interesting because I was railing the other day about the fact that I don't think there are any copy editors anymore. There still are in literary fiction. There are because you know there are none at the local <laughs> newspaper. There are none, in, and you do see mistakes. I think there was one typo in your book. Uh, there's one? at least there's at least, at least a couple. Okay, I saw one. There's at least a couple. I, you know how I noticed is when I had to read the whole thing out loud <laughs> yeah, to do yeah, the yeah. audio book. You, you find them. So I mean, things do get through. They the, do get through the cracks, but the co- but copy editors are um, are still a big part of uh, of writing of of book writing these days and it's amazing how much work it is to go through all of the queries oh, that they send you to answer every I single little imagine. question it's like oh, i wish this guy would just leave me alone so one of the big to do's locally right now is this lyft and uber and yada yada yeah and there's a funny bit toward the beginning of the book <laughs> where these two are leaving a bar on mount washington rather quickly since one of them has been in a fight and he jumps in his car and he throws a wad of money at our uh, narrator and says, here, get a cab. And <laughs> Yeah, and then one of the drunks comes out of the bar. <laughs> he says, you can't get no cabs in yeah, Pittsburgh. Right. <laughs> What's he mean? You can't get no cabs? Yeah. I, I, well, you can't. You can't no. have a cab in Pittsburgh. It's, <laughs> no, you can't. it's crazy. I mean, I've, you know, I've been in a lot of I've been in a lot of. <laughs> Other places in the world, and even I mean, you know, I so when I was in college, you know, I I did a study abroad for a little while. I lived in France. I lived in Strasbourg, which is a city which is about the same size as Pittsburgh. But even in like little towns, you can you can hail a cab That's if right. you want to get a cab. Right. I mean, there's always a cab around. But here, the only place you can get a what you have to do is you have to Hotel? go into the lobby of the William Penn and then s- through one of the side entrances and then sneak out the front door so make that they think like make it look like you're a guest and then you can get a cab. But then of course you can't get a cab back to anywhere after you've well, gone. Well, that's true. <laughs> It's true. All they want to do is go to the airport. It's and, true. And, and, and be- now, you do borrow little things from the city. For instance, somewhere in this book, you have the head of Blue Cross Blue Shield <laughs> <laughs> turning up drunk somewhere or other. But it was clearly based on this. I mean, has to be on what's his yeah. name? Mulaney. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, it's a but his loo- name is loose. not Malay. No, yeah. no, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, as as it says, you know, you uh, any any resemblance to any yeah, right. any characters living or dead is strictly coincidental. This work book of work of fiction, et cetera, but et truth be, being sometimes stranger. Than there's fiction, also a I mean, there's that, also a a young mayor who you I, may I, recognize. I, I, there's a young mayor, and then there's a guy who works for the young mayor who I thought not. Who named Kansky, right? Yeah. Who I thought was a little bit of a Yaron Zober. A little bit. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. Got it. 
I got it. <laughs> so, I mean, all, you know, all of those things. I mean, again, you, you don't, uh, you know, you would never. But they're uh, not. I mean, clearly not. No, they're not. They're not. None of them is, you know, explicitly. They're all sort okay. of just loosely based to give, again, to give that sort of that sort of texture. But I, I love those sort of, I mean, that's what makes a city, that's what makes a city an interesting place to be is those, those sort of goofy there's odd, odd little, happenings little characters, and characters and happenings and characters. And there aren't as many characters as they used to be, something I rail about a lot. Maybe you're too young to know. There used to be more. Well, I'm, so I'm actually – I'm uh, the manuscript I'm working on um, right now, the novel I'm working on right now, is also set in western Pennsylvania. And um, uh, some of the characters are, uh, are property developers who um, – <laughs> Anyway, it's about a lot of it is set in the nineteen. A lot of it is set in the in the mid '80s into the early '90s, um, and so there's a, a number of interesting oh lo- local characters who oh who boy. you may recognize. And plus, I don't know if you if you if you have ever driven on the road to nowhere, Route 43, the Mon Fayette Expressway. But I'm also having yeah. a, a really good time writing about the uh, the great boondoggle of the Mon Fayette I Expressway. I think I was on it once. A strangely lovely, uh, non, not a pothole in sight, and not a car in sight. That's why there are no potholes, because there are no (laughs) cars. cars. Nobody's ever driven on it. And how much did the taxpayers, I wonder, spend for that? Yeah, quite a lot. Yeah. We're talking about this great new book, The Bend of the World. Um, And let me tell you, this guy, first-time novelist, getting praise from some pretty heavy duty. Really? I saw... Gary Steingart. We, now I haven't read his. People are raving about his uh, uh, his new little, memoir, Little Failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is the book, the book. Here's what Gary Steingart says about your book. Ever wonder what would happen if the mysteries of Pittsburgh were mugged in a dark alley by a cocaine addicted Sasquatch? Well, wonder no more. Just buy the book and enjoy. <laughs> I, I have to say, I like I like that one. Well, well. Um, so, uh, Gary Steingart is had a reputation for being like the the most generous uh, blurber oh, of really? books, especially for new novelists out there. And in fact, he he very recently, actually, just after this book came out. He very recently announced that he was no longer able to keep up his pace of blurbing books. Because he so, has to read them. Because he has to, to read them. Um, so anyway, so I was joking with my editor. I said we got in just just yeah. under the under the wire with him. But uh, the the blurbs, the advanced praise. I mean, that's all. Uh, I have to thank uh, my my editor Will Menaker at Liverite, which is my imprint um, of W. W. Norton, who's my publisher. Um, those guys were the ones who went Knew out. Knew where to yeah. go. Yeah, the 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 only the only person on there who I, I guess I can take some credit for James Wolcott. Well, I, I Jay, uh, we no? we a little bit, but um, it was my editor who really reached out to to uh, to Jim and asked him to do that. Um, uh, Dan Sean, actually, who was a professor of mine at Oberlin. Um, who is an amazing writer, uh, National Book Award winner, um, and Dan uh, was someone who uh, who I knew from back in, okay. in my uh, back in my Oberlin writing days. Who uh, was very very nice and generous to blurb the book as well. But the rest of them, I can take no credit for. That was all um, the crack team at Liverite. Um, I, I, sending out bitcoins or whatever to scam these people into blurbing my book. Well, he calls it a brilliant portrait of a new generation of fledgling adults. (laughs) And I got to read Wolcott's. Yeah, his is pretty good. James Wolcott, in case you don't know. I mean, I only know him from his work in Vanity Fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but he's also uh, he's also written a number of books and most recently a really interesting history of sort of underground New York. Um, in the late '70s, in particular, um, when he he was first there working for the the Village Voice, I believe, and going to CBGBs and all that sort of. Th- and he, it's a real interesting portrait. Wait a minute, of, CBGBs? Yeah, I don't know what CBGBs. Well, like a famous punk club in downtown. Oh yes, listen, <laughs> I'm on Medicare. Okay, <laughs> give me a break, you two young things. So uh, he, you know, so his 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 early day his early days in New York are really a really uh, great collection of of nonfiction writing. So anyway, he, a great I, great guy, great writer. I get to read this blurb, James Wolcott. 
Mighty Strange Doings in the Pittsburgh of Jacob Bacharach's mind-tripping debut novel, The Bend of the World, a regular X-Files a go-go, where Yeti, UFOs, rumors of orgiastic rites, Im- intimations of Mayan ap- apocalypse, and psychotemporal distortions add that extra zing to the bustling nightlife. The Bend of the World, in its biting, microscopic portrait of our wackadoo republic, makes me proud and ashamed <laughs> to be an American, <laughs> but most of all, happy to be a reader of Jacob Bacharach's. Damn, is he sharp. Yeah, you're funny. You're obviously smart as hell. You've read a lot on a lot of things. So all the stuff on the Mayan stuff and the psychotemporal distortion stuff, I got to tell you, sometimes, I mean, my eyes crossed (laughs) and I thought, what the? F is he talking about? <laughs> you know, even more so actually than um, staying true to the geography of Pittsburgh, I sort of tried to stay true to a lot of, uh, at least the texture of a lot of actual conspiracy theories that are out there. I so mean, you I, really, this stuff is, I mean, I know oh, it's, I know the Mayan calendar stuff is real and yeah, and the Fourth River stuff. And yeah. The, yeah. I mean, what I ended, what I did was I took a lot of, I took some, some uh, conspiracy, various conspiracy theories, most of them not in any way related to Pittsburgh and sort of gave them, uh, overlaid them with that that local geography, local characters and, and so forth and so on. But yeah, I, I mean, especially um, with the uh, internet f- at your fingertips, I mean, you could really <laughs> go, go down into a, a dark, dark place and never emerge from the incredible, <laughs> the incredible depth of conspiracy theorizing online. And I love that stuff because I think that, um, I think that there's a lot of similarities between the construction of a conspiracy theory and the construction of a, of a narrative, of a novel. You know, you take all of these disparate things that, you know, in real life, there's no narrative, there's no texture to our lot, you know, just one thing right, happening right, after right, another. Right, right, right. And so to take all of those things and to kind of mash them together into something coherent and whole was this sort of inherently artificial act. And that's what you do when you write a book. But it's also what you do when you're creating a conspiracy, whether it's a conspiracy related to, you know, to politics or to, to, to civilization or to whatever the case may be. It's taking all these sort of disparate things um, with no necessarily real causal connection to each other. They just happen to be sort of synchronized in the same place or the same right. time. Right. saying, well, A causes B causes C causes D, and there's your conspiracy theory. So I think there's a neat parallel between those things. God, it's such a good book, really. I, I've recommended it to so many people. Tom Sokolowski uh, emailed me one day and said, you got to read this book, Jacob Bagrag, The Bend of the World. I just picked it up. And I, th- I thought, well, I'm way ahead of you, buddy. I not only had the book, I lost the book. <laughs> I am so far ahead of you. So um, Tom will be here tomorrow, by the, by the way. And um, geez, so I was going to ask you what you're working on next because you're obviously just going to keep, keep on and going. So yeah. you got another. So how do you. So maybe you do have one of those jobs where you don't really have that much to do. <laughs> no, you know, I tend to write. To do this? I tend to write um, in the morning uh, before I go to the office, or in the afternoon really? when I in the evening when I get home from work. Um, yeah, mo- and uh, on weekends when I can. Um, and I'm a fa- I'm a I'm a very fast writer. So I mean, once oh. I start writing, I think I think about it a lot. Um, and then when you start, I just think just about it in my head, and then but then once I s- start writing it down, I, I write really in pretty good. finished form. Really? Wow! Oh, yeah. I'm envious. So, I mean, so. I can't I can't claim never to be daydreaming about my next book while I'm sitting in the office, but uh, um, and I will say actually for this book in particular. So one of the things I actually do do um, at the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust uh, in, at the Benetton Center <laughs> is uh, uh, for all of our uh, all the shows that come through the theater. I do, we call them the, the settlement, which is basically the sort of financial reconciliation at the end of a show. So after the last production of, the last show of whatever Broadway production is in town, uh, everybody, you know, sits down and takes all of the, the labor bills and the rent and everything else and then all of the income from the tickets and puts it all together and, you know, figures out who owes what to whom. So I do. That's what, one of the things that I do for the trust. So that frequently... Well, that's good you got that MBA then. Well, yeah. So, yeah. so frequently I actually end up, you know, find myself sitting in the office at night waiting for the show to be over. And 
you know, and I do some work for the for the trust certainly while I'm while I'm there. But there's a lot of hurry up and wait and that sort of thing. You know, waiting for the box office to close, waiting for the curtain to come down. You know, waiting for all the final receipts to come in, that sort of thing. So I will say that I did, you know, take advantage of some of those, you know, 11 p.m., 12 p.m. at night sitting right. in an office, and I would I would get a little bit of writing done while waiting kind of for the next thing to happen. So you, you kind of have to just grab time wherever you can. Well, you sound like somebody who doesn't. Um waste a lot of time. I do like taking naps. I do you do? A, you I, take I, naps? I like naps. You seem young yeah. for naps. You take no. naps. Oh, naps are I, they're very... I, think I that, mean, can you do a little nap? I mean, see, I, yeah, if I, I take a, a nap, little... I'm, I'm out. And no, I, I'm, I think that the, I think that the, uh, the absence nap. of a siesta is, is going yeah. to be the downfall of our civilization. Yeah. Well, tell me about it. <laughs> and instead, it's going the other way, where all those poor Spaniards are being told now, look, we got to... Global capitalism is requiring us to stop with this, and we've got to be on, you know, work as hard, and they're doing away with that. Yeah. And, and, it's still yeah, not it, doing them any good. No, it's still, they're, they're, they're still all screwed up, I know. So, but I know you do a lot of, I mean, you know, I sit on a board with you. You do a lot of stuff beyond. I just try yeah. never to be bored. How the hell do you pull that off? I always have to be, you know. Doing something. So you must be, and I've seen you out and about at certain social functions, you must be, an, obviously from the book, an extremely astute observer of humans, of their foibles, of their interactions, of how they even hold themselves or what. You've got to be. I, mean, I like to think be. so. <laughs> no. But, I mean, I'm thinking now that I see how good you are, God, I'm going to act around you like a lot of people act when they hear someone's a psychiatrist. <laughs> you know, <laughs> be careful, be careful get real say. uptight, not, you know, be afraid to say anything. Because, I mean, you're obviously plumbing in creating characters and, and all of this, your experience yes. of humans. Well, I like to. I mean, I think it's important to. I, I think it's important to listen uh, if you're going to be a writer to listen to the way that people talk, uh, in particular. Um, I think that that the you think the, dialogue is the hardest thing to write. Uh, well, I think I don't know that it's the hardest thing to write. I actually quite enjoy writing dialogue. In fact, I much prefer writing dialogue to writing descriptive passages. I will. I will say that um, it's much writing description is much harder for me than writing dialogue. Well, you're good it takes. At both. It, well, thank you, but it takes me a lot longer. I have to think about it. Um, and uh, and also description can be kind of banal. You know, that's one of the things. G going from having been a poet, you know, as a as a college student into being a writer of fiction. I mean, one of the most annoying things is like in fiction, sometimes you have to write. He got up and opened the door, and it's like there are these little <laughs> bits of you know banal things that you have to put into a work of fiction to yeah. get people from one place yeah, to another you do. that you don't have to do in poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that um, in particular, when it comes to sort of uh, evoking the the content of people's uh, character um, and making some sort of gesture at a realistic psychology and character is the most important thing is the way that people express themselves verbally, more, more important than almost anything else. And I think that people's um, uh, ticks of language are the most sort of revelatory things about them. So, I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time listening to people when I'm – we both ride the bus to and from work, so I spend a lot of time listening to people yap at oh. each other on the bus. That's a great – and in bars and at parties. I mean, you, you'd, be, you'd be amazed what you can learn if you just Listen. shut your mouth and stand there with your glass of wine. Oh, damn it. <laughs> See, now you know, having seen me at a party, that I don't do that. I'm one of the yappers. Yeah, people. Yeah, people it'd are, be better to. Yeah, people are un, it's people are unintentionally, um, you know, revelatory. But you, I don't think. I mean, there are some. I think there are some authors. There, I know there are. There are some writers who, you know, really, you know, yank people sort of whole cloth out of out of life and just turn yeah, them into yeah. a character. Uh, I don't really do that, and uh, for the most part, because most people are actually terribly boring. I say this about myself all the time when people are like, is this book autobiographical? I mean, no. I mean, I'm boring. I have a job. I go to the job. I go home. You're I walk the dog. I know what my you mean. My, you know, yeah, my you boyfriend are. and I have dinner. We watch, you know, we watch an episode of MasterChef on Netflix, and then yeah. we go to bed. So and I write a little bit in between. It's boring. Most people are boring. So what, when you, you have to sort of create this sort of like heightened – um, personalities in order to create something, people who are interesting in a book. And so, you know, what I really, what you really do is you just sort of take the most sort of egregious examples of people's, you know, um, foolishness or incoherency, and then you, you ramp them up even more, and then you combine a few of them, and then you have a character. Well, I'm going to 
put down my wine glass next time I see you <laughs> at a party. Um, God, I'm glad you wrote this, and I'm so proud of you. I, I'm going to get to say, oh, yeah, Jacob, uh, yeah, mm -hmm, pals. The Bend of the World, getting tons of good press, tons more coming. Treat yourself. Treat yourself to this book. I am not kidding you. Oh, it's so good. Your mom must be just Kvelling, I think is the word. <laughs> she, she is a, She has been a, an excellent promoter <laughs> of the book. Uh, I, I love it. So, so uh, I think you should get back to work at the Benedum. Uh, yeah, Who knows uh, what's going on there now? Uh, the place could be it, falling it, apart even as we speak. It could damn well. I think, I think they can make it without me for an hour. Ah. I'm, I'm pretty confident. Okay. Well, then let's, let's keep you for the hour. Let's take a break. Okay? In a Stick minute. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Hi, I'm LeVar Burton, and I'm proud to be a book person. How do I choose a book? Sometimes it's the cover, sometimes it's the title. I guess I'm pretty visual. If a book's really impressing me and the writing is really good, I will peek and see what the last paragraph is because the endings of books should rock you. I am a book person, and if you're a book person too, read to a child and spark a lifetime of ambition. Join me at bookpeopleunite.org because reading is fundamental. A public service announcement brought to you by Reading is Fundamental, Library of Congress, and the Ad Council. It's Pittsburgh City Papers annual City Guide magazine is available now. Pick up one for a special look at the unique neighborhoods of Pittsburgh, plus the most complete guides of restaurants, bars, nightlife, festivals, exhibits, entertainment, and culture in the Berg. Pittsburgh City Paper available at over 1,700 locations throughout Western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com, on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Oh, we're back? Hang on, I'm entangled. Okay, who warned against entangling alliances? Uh, let's see. Was that was that uh, Washington? Yes, in his, that was, was in in his farewell address. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. If Na it was nations it was do not have friends, but interests. Yeah. See. Think of that next time you're wondering where your kid could go to school. Oh, Berlin. Well, oh, you know, it, oh, you knew that before then. Well, Washington it features very, very briefly in part of the conspiracy in in the bend of the world. It's 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 easy to miss, but he oh, it, when, right. during the French and Indian War, right. he 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 appears briefly as a, a potential avatar of the Bavarian Illuminati. <laughs> ah, <laughs> 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 oh, jeez. Hey. Go over to the Cathedral of Learning on this beautiful afternoon, and you think from the front door to um, – I'm trying to figure out if um, – I think it, it's I think it's a little more than 57 paces if maybe, you stay on the sidewalk, but maybe as the crow flies. Oh, no, you, it's a crow fly. Yeah, if I you can, think if you can walk, right through, walk right through the hedges and across the lawn. I, it's 57, a, yeah, try yeah, it. Long, I have long legs, so. <laughs> so I want – oh, wait, before – Little item I ripped out of the paper today and ripped half of I always do that, and then I have to try to figure out what those words are. But I'm going to get this is a little business related thing about the drug firm, Swiss drug firm Novartis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has struck up an agreement with Google. Huh. And listen to what, yeah, I'll tell you, the world gets stranger and stranger. Listen, listen, I can't even begin to imagine the world you're going to see. Okay. Uh, they are going to together develop smart contact lenses that would allow diabetics <laughs> to track their blood glucose levels. So you'll just be wearing your okay. contacts no. and you won't have to be jabbing yourself and all that kind of stuff. The device for diabetics would measure glucose in tear fluid, send the data wirelessly to a mobile device. The device would allow Novartis to compete in the growing diabetic tracking market. But do you think that in, let's say, 10 years, that we will all be like wearing things, thing, I mean, Constant blood pressure readouts, uh, glucose levels, right? Because I just had to go over to the hospital and have them jab me and take out blood and do all this and then blah, blah, blah. And in 10 years, I would think that would be considered 
prehistoric. Yeah, you know it's funny. It, I, I'm, there's another uh, local novelist whose whose book is out this year, Tom Tom Swetterlich, whose book is is even a more sort of tr- traditionally science fictional than my own. It's called Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Very good, by the way. I'm, plug it. <laughs> Actually, I reviewed it for the Post Gazette, so it's a good book, really good. Oh, I saw so, your review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so in his his book is set a little further in the future, sort of the 20 2050s, and that's um, w- one of the um, principal sort of uh, bits of, of setting an atmosphere in the book is that everybody is just is completely sort of infused um, with technology um, that's actually sort of been to- inco- biologically incorporated into their right. bodies. Right. Um, although I saw him give a, a, a talk and a reading the other day, and he said, well, but I think that probably wearables are what the, what the future is really going to be, well, which is more along the lines, I guess, of what the contact lenses are. But I, right. no, yeah, I disagree. I, mean, I, I think it's going to be implants because at some point, we're going to say, why should I be sticking this on when I can just stick it in? Yeah, I don't know. I can't even wear contacts, say, though. They bother my eyes. Well, let's hope you don't become diabetic. <laughs> I'd stay away from <laughs> high fructose corn okay. syrup. So do you know this guy, Ray Kurzweil? Yeah, singularity man. Yeah. yeah. Well. You know what they call the singularity. The rapture for nerds. Okay. <laughs> well, I signed on long ago, and I mean, I never even read anything he wrote. I figured it out myself. <laughs> I did. And then I heard about him. But he's written this, um, uh, well, he didn't write this, but he says, by 2045, so that if your friend's book is set in 2050, 2000, he says, by 2030, computers won't only be able to understand spoken language, but will show emotion. Show emotion, computers. Okay. And he says that by 1945, computers and humans will pretty much be merged. His position, by the way, is director of engineering at Google. So lest you think he's some kind of like mad scientist, he's chief of engineering at Google and he sees this by 45, you're going to be oh, still a who, young person. Who says that you can't be both a mad scientist and a chief of engineering right. at Google? I, <laughs> I think he knows that we are going to cyborgize ourselves. I think that the impediments are greater than the technologists like him think that they are. I, I do. And what would those impediments be? I think that both I, – I think that they over – I think that we will look back on some of those predictions in the same way that we now in 2014 – like where the hell's my flying car? You, it's, you know coming. What I mean? it's coming. It's coming. No, it's coming. I, I, think that, I think that making predictions multiple decades out, we tend to look at our very present moment and we tend to make the predictions based on our, our, our own – cultural and technological prejudices rather than on any realistic vision of what's going to happen. So if you think about the flying car, I mean, you know, and the Jetsons and all of that sort of thing. I mean, what, like, what's the Jetsons if not, you know, like the 1960s just with flying yeah, cars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right, and, exactly. and so I, not, and I think maybe Kurzweil and his ilk are a little more sophisticated than that. But I, I think that I think well, that science fiction has been way ahead of I mean, science fiction ceases to be fiction 20, 30 years later. Sometimes. But at the same time, I mean, you know, I, Isaac Asimov, he thought that we would have robots, but he didn't know about the Internet. So I think that I, wow. I, I'm just uh, you know, I'm just saying I, I, I tend to take a slightly skeptical line on it. Well, I sure as hell don't. I <laughs> gobble this up left, right and center. Listen to Kurzweil here. In some ways, we've already. Well, he says when it comes to mobile devices. OK, you got your smartphone. I got my smartphone. Uh, he says, philosophically, I don't see a significant difference uh, between whether technology is in my hand or inside my brain. It's really an extension of my brain already, the smartphone, but we will make it more convenient eventually by directly connecting it to our brains. Yeah, but he works for Google, so really, 
Really? What's your smartphone is more than anything is just a vehicle for delivering more damn ads to your eyeballs. And oh that's, God! So, can you imagine if ads come into your brain? But and that's no way so, of stopping it. So, so I'm going to keep plugging Tom Swetterlich's <laughs> book. So that's actually that's exactly what happens <laughs> in Tom's book. People walk around all day long, and everything that you look at, the implants it's in your ad. brain, figure out what it is that you're looking at, and they give you an ad for a related oh for a related God. good or service. That's what's going to happen, though. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> he oh. may be. Oh, jeez. It's a nightmare. I'll go live in one of those. But see, that's good that I grew up in Fayette County because <laughs> I, I learned those survival skills. I can just go live in the woods, off the land. Well, here's where he sounds odd. He consumes 120 vitamins and supplements every day, takes nutri- nu- nutrients intravenously, drinks green tea and exercises regularly, he really thinks he's going to be able to maybe kind of sort of pull it off and live forever or something. So he is nuts. He, but have you ever seen the movie The Big Lebowski? Unlike some cultists. <laughs> I, I saw it when you, it came out, okay. but I, I can't remember okay, it well, so there's, well. So there's a, there's a scene in it where Jeff Bridges, yes. uh, uh, the dude, is in, in the Malibu home of this uh, pornographer. And the, a very kind of Hugh Hefner type, and this is a, I, I, it's, I it's set it's set in the '90s, the early okay. '90s, and 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 he says, and and the Hugh Hefner character says, you know, we're 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 going to be able to do very exciting things with erotic interactive software, and and Jeff the Bridges dude. looks at the, the the dude looks at him, he says, yeah, well, I still jerk off manually. <laughs> 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 hey man, you know, reach the same end. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that's cute. Can you do the whole movie by heart? I, I can do a lot of it by oh heart. Yeah, I, I, I can do a fair amount of really? it. Really? Yeah. I, I won't. I won't. You'll get into some that you'll probably have to pay. I don't know what's the equivalent of ASCAP BMI for quoting movies on the air. But oh, this is the internet. You could. They. Can, I could do anything. It's fair use. Fair use. Yeah. Right. Okay. Just one more thing. He thinks that nanobots. Teeny weeny little robots will one day travel to our brains through our capillaries, and that blood cell sized computers will connect to the cloud the way our iPhones do now. I have little doubt. I'm just glad I'll be dead. <laughs> you will not. <laughs> I told him I'm gonna my go. Son. I'm gonna go live. On, well, live, he can come live off the land with me. In Fayette County? Yeah, we'll find some. <laughs> we'll find some abandoned Marcellus <laughs> gas <laughs> wellhead. <laughs> Get ourselves some. Oh, you you should do a send up on fracking. Oh, it's in my it's in my new. Book. Oh, it is. It is yeah. in the book. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's a bunch. It's about a bunch of real estate developers. All well, right. it's really about the story of Abraham, but it's about a bunch of real estate. <laughs> it's about a bunch of real estate developers who uh, who have this big scam to build this meaningless highway to nowhere. Will you stick those headphones on? Because apparently we have a phone call. Hello. Yeah, sorry to call three days in a row. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'll take it up <laughs> with you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you have to uh, plug his blog. I read a couple things on there yesterday when you mentioned his name. He's good. This this guy sitting next to me? Yes. He's good? He's a good his blog. You don't have to tell me. What the hell have I been well, telling you, Well, you have to tell the You're plugging his book, but you also have to plug his blog. All right, so plug his blog. I bookmarked it. <laughs> it's so oh, can can I plug my own blog? Yeah, plug your own blog. Be <laughs> well, it's um it's uh it's actually it's at my website, my author site, which is jacobbacharach.com and uh, there is a, a a blog on that site which is called Blogger Act. <laughs> and that's where my blog is. And so besides writing their next novel, you write a blog, too? Yeah. 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 What's, that's what they say on the internet. Content is king. I'm a content creator. Okay. So, Clarence, why'd you like it? I don't know. It was just, uh, you know, I, I, I like reading interesting stuff. And, I, you know, and I just thought, man, that guy can write. <laughs> yes, he can. Yeah, it, it was a long post, too. And I went, wow, I'm reading this whole thing. Sometimes I'll start blogs like, oh, I'm bored, and I'll go to the next thing. His, I read, I read like one of his, uh, his most recent ones, and I liked it. So I said, so I bookmarked it. So I'm going to come back when I have more time. How often do you uh, put something up? Uh, not as often as I would like, actually. Maybe, maybe once a week or so. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of, aside from a job, I have a lot of other writing that I have to do as well. So it's, it's tough to keep up with it regularly. But and I, so I, I try to. What is that blog about? So what was the subject? It's about whatever interests me at any given time. What was it, Clarence? Oh, with, with the one I read yesterday. Yeah. It was about. Um, so you can't even remember. I just remember it was good. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
That's, that's a good, that? that's that's a good impression to leave people with. Uh, you don't know. It was the 18th Burma of Samuel Alito at all. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it was about the Hobby Lobby decision. Oh. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Because <laughs> I like the way he has, he has it numbered for some reason that I don't understand, but I thought it was good. So did you, um, I assume you ridiculed. Yeah, I, 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 that's the principal purpose of a blog is to uh, take something by somebody who's better known than you and make fun of it. Okay. That's, that's the fundamental <laughs> underlying principle of the medium. Ridicule. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. So yeah, just read that one and you'll see it's, 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 written, it's written, I don't know, interestingly. It's yeah, almost well, a story or something. I don't know. Well, the I way don't he writes it, yeah. it's cool, huh? I don't doubt it because, you know, so you're going to run out and get the book, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I won't run out. I'll internet it, but. <laughs> yeah. So your book, th Clarence, thank you. You're welcome. If Bye. you call tomorrow, you're dead. Is he gone? Yeah. yeah. I love him. I can't, that's Clarence from Cannonsburg. Who's Clarence been, from Cannonsburg. Who's been calling me for, jeez, 25 years easy. Huh. We've grown old together. <laughs> <laughs> so, damn, I had a thought. I had a thought and it disappeared. So, okay, I'm going to look at your blog too then cuz that are they usually such long posts? No, or actually a lot of them a lot of a lot of what I post there is, is are actually um, sonnets. <laughs> oh, the poet returns. Yeah, yeah. Sonnets. Yeah, topical sonnets. Oddnesque topical sonnets. I think nobody writes sonnets. Oh, I love sonnets. It's the the limitations of the medium force you to be do uh, a, creative. Do a Shakespeare sonnet for us. I don't think I could repeat do oh, a whole do one. A whole I mean, one? I mean, uh, let us not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love which alters where it alteration finds or bends with the deceiver to deceive. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark. Which something, oh. something, 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 something. Oh. It is a star to every wandering bark, whose height be known, although its depth be taken. Uh, blah blah blah. If this be oh. something false upon me proved, I never written or no man ever loved. loved. So I almost That's got right. almost, no almost the whole thing. But I can, rhyming I can do a couple of proved them. and loved. I don't know about that. Well, they rhymed at the time because they said, "Loved," <laughs> or did uh, they say "proved"? Proved. They did. You yeah. sure about that? Yeah. In fact, there's a, okay, a talk about the internet. There's this fascinating. I, you'd have to Google it. I can't remember the Google. <laughs> so it's back again. You'd have to Google it. I can't remember exactly where it was, but I think it was at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, it was a, a, a current actor and then a, a linguistic expert, and they were doing both current pronunciations and then going back and doing Elizabethan, reconstructed Elizabethan yeah. pronunciations. And it's it's fascinating. So, I mean, like, do you know, like, so the taming of the shrew, um, there are a bunch of weird off rhymes in that because shrew of the way it's pronounced, but it was well, actually pronounced shrew. shrew. Yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Can you do Chaucer in? Um, no, what? I can't. I can't do Chaucer. My my brother. Here's what I think. One that a preedle with a shoe soda, the drought of marsh a person to the road. Does that sound a little like someone in Minnesota? And both of every vein and sweet liqueur, of which fair two hundred is the fleur. When I... Zephyrus with his blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know the, uh, how, Do you know this poem? I love this poem. That's my last duchess. No. Oh, God, is that a great poem. My favorite poem. Ah! I forgot who wrote it. Oh, that's Browning, yeah. Oh, oh is it? Oh, oh. yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah. That's my last duchess on the wall. And then he goes into all this, the narrator, and it becomes clear that he killed her. It is uh, brilliant. Okay, that's enough poetry. No one likes poetry anymore. I love it. I, yeah, poetry's great. It Some is. people like poetry. Very few, and you talk about, you know, you know, when you say nerds now and the, this, this expectation that nerds, I mean, the, the sense that nerds are like some little minority of, you know, nerds, they're triumphant. Oh, this but people is still a, write poetry. But this is a nerd world. This is a, the nerds are triumphant. Yeah, no, that's true. That is true. Yeah. And for <laughs> artists, that could be a little unsettling. Well, I, I mean, mean I, that's, I'm a nerd. You're not quite a nerd. Well... Not okay. quite. Close. Okay. okay. You think when we become cyborgized, we'll still appreciate poetry? 
it'll be a it'll be a, po- uh, a poetry of ones and zeros, maybe. But oh dear God, no. hexadecimal poetry. Ah! Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Get this book. I'm serious. Have you not read a novel in a while? Come on, catch up. And anyway, it's just a delight. Jacob Backrack, the bend of the world. Available everywhere. Available everywhere. Anywhere fine books are sold. Anywhere not fine books are sold. Even in uh, a, a, a brick and mortar establishment. Yeah, support uh, <laughs> support uh, Caliban, East End, Book oh, Exchange. Yeah, yeah. Support your local bookshop if you can. But if you can't, um, use uh, use the internet with your brainwaves. Send your brainwaves over the internet. They'll send you a book. That's right. Oh, what a world. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank this you, Len. It was great. Oh, what fun. Okay, tomorrow, Sokolowski. Who the hell knows what will happen? Bye. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.